I'm Spencer Fluman, the uh, executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute at Brigham Young University. And I am here with Patrick Mason, the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University. And uh, our topic today uh, relates to a, a book that you wrote, uh, Patrick, that we actually published at the Maxwell Institute, co-published with Desert Book. It's called Planted. And uh, part of that book was aimed at uh, what we might call the, uh, the peaks and valleys of the journey of faith, especially for uh, modern Latter-day Saints. Um, and so we want to talk through that today. Um, what do we make of these valleys of faith, sometimes even the loss of faith in the people we love? Um, and uh, those of us who um, are still kind of on that journey of faith, uh, what's our relationship to those folks? So that, that's kind of our broad topic. But maybe to start us, talk about what kind of prompted the book for you. What brought out Planted yeah. uh, from you? No, that's a great question. And uh, I mean, you and I are both historians, and we were trained in secular graduate programs, and yeah. and we're sort of on our way in our early careers. And so that was, you know, my job. I, I was teaching about Mormonism, but but not in a. I was not at BYU. I'm not teaching in a kind of faith promoting way, and 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 was very comfortable doing my scholarship. And uh, but but I had the opportunity to to do some of these firesides uh, that. Uh, you know, to address issues of kind of doubt and, and these kinds of peaks and valleys of, of the faith journey. And, and by talking to people uh, around the United States and Canada and, and hearing their stories, feeling a sense of pain yeah. that people were experiencing on both sides of this. As you said, both the people who were going through these, these kinds of transitions and, and trying to figure out what they believed or what they didn't believe anymore and how to, uh, how to relate to their families and the church and all that kind of stuff. But then also the people who were still in, yeah. you know, the family members and, and so much pain on both sides and just a depth of feeling. And at every one of these firesides, they, they, they would just say, you know, where can we read the book or where can we, where can we you know, hear more about this? And, and at a certain point, I just felt compelled to, to, to write the book. I mean, I remember reaching out to you because you were on the circuit, you know, uh, yeah. doing some of these kinds of things as well. And Richard and Claudia Bushman and Terrell and Fiona Givens. I mean, so a handful of us had been out there doing that. And so, so I, I just felt like there needed to be something that people could have in their hands you yeah. know, to, to be able to work through uh, some of those things. So it really came out of just talking to people and, and feeling, uh, hearing their experiences and, and feeling the kind of pain in the community that I love. Yeah, and I, I'll add the word fear yeah. to your word pain. As I was out kind of interacting with BYU students, uh, with their concerned family members at times, I've had more than one parent uh -huh. reach out and say, hey, this really helped this you know, child of mine in your in your class. Thank you. Where can I get more of this kind of thing? Um, there's a, a great fear around the idea of losing faith, or or what sometimes we call doubt. Doubt itself, that word, can be really threatening to some folks. I right. found some really strong reactions to the word doubt. Uh, worried that um, by by, for instance, by talking about doubt, that somehow it's going to grow. Right. You know that it's it somehow it's we gonna, validate it. We va you validate it or something. So, I mean, even that. In and of itself, to me, is a is a an indicator of of some deep things in our community um, that are are powerful. Because on the one hand, I can reframe doubt as questioning. Sure, some of my conversation partners prefer that. Um, my response has often been, um, yeah, there, there, is a, there are some folks who I've talked to who have been in a place where they're like, I, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, but I'm still operating from a position of faith and generosity, and I want to pursue this question. Give me new tools so I can pursue this question in new ways. Right. And that, I think that's legitimate. I, I wouldn't, I, in some cases, doubt doesn't seem to work. But that's not all the people I talk with. Right. Sometimes I talk with people, and it's, um, I don't think I believe that, yeah. that you believe. Or I don't think I believe anymore. 
Um, That's gone beyond just a question. It's gone beyond a question. It's they're in a different place. And when if I were to come and say them, well, what you're what you're experiencing isn't doubt. <laughs> They're going to look at me like, what it's kind like, of violence and condescension right. are you... Okay, find a better word in the English yeah, language. Yeah, right. but that's, right. what, that's where they're at. Yeah. And so so the, the combination of fear, the combination of, of pain, in your experience, what puts people here? How do they find themselves here well, at, I, at that place? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I, I think we have to recognize the context here, which is a, a spiritual community for which one of our great strengths as Latter-day Saints has been uh, a, a sense of spiritual certitude, right? Yeah. That, that, that we believe, and there are promises in, in the Book of Mormon and in other things, that if you pray, that God will reveal things to you and you will know things by the Holy Ghost. And, and those of us who, have, who were raised in the church or those who are converts, and I mean, when you, when you go to fast and testimony meeting, what do you hear over and over? I know, I know, I know. And so that just gets built in to not just the language we use, but but into the way we think that spirituality works. Yeah. That it's that it's about certitude, and that if 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 you come up anything short of that, then you, you know that's that's not the gold standard, right? And and you might not not even be on the right track, right? Yeah. If if you can't use the language of I know, well well somehow obviously you're not in tune with the Holy Ghost. So there's that kind of context, and it's oftentimes unspoken. Uh, because it is one of the great strengths of the community. And so when people get to the place where they feel like they can't say, I know, then that creates challenges for them. And I think it usually happens in a couple of different ways. One is that they encounter information about the church, oftentimes church history or church doctrine, things that, that uh, don't square with what they learn in church and, and hear about from the pulpit. And sometimes they'll dismiss these things immediately as kind of anti-Mormon slurs and things like that. But the more that they research, and of course the internet gives all of this information yeah. to us, it just, you know, uh, it's, it's very easy to find this information in a way that it wasn't even 20 years ago. Yeah. And so they find this information is disconcerting, it, it, it doesn't square with what they've learned, and they realize that it isn't just lies, uh, there's actually factual basis to these things. Yeah. And, and now they've got a problem. Yeah. Right? So there's that, and then there's another category of, of, of people, and sometimes there's, a lot of times there's overlap, but people who just feel like that the church doesn't feel comfortable to them anymore, that there isn't a place for them, that, that uh, oftentimes this happens for uh, people who feel like they just don't fit in. Maybe, maybe they're uh, gay or lesbian or, or allies of them, and, and, and they feel like the, the church's current doctrines and practices don't allow them to be authentic uh, yeah. or have those kinds of questions. Uh, maybe it's because they're, uh, they don't conform to what is the kind of dominant mode of, of kind of political and ideological conservatism in the American church. And they feel like, I, I can't even be me when I, when I go to church. Yeah. Or there's gender issues. So, so they just, they may or may not have questions about the history or about particular points of doctrine, but it's about they just, I'm not sure that this is the place for me. Yeah. And that's really disconcerting. It is. And I'm wondering about, you know, what, what, what you've prompted in, in in my mind, are, are some findings of uh, uh, of a researcher uh, by the name of Jana Reese, uh, mm -hmm. and she, she's undertaken this massive survey of, of Latter Day Saints and and some Latter Day Saints who have, or former Latter Day Saints and so on. And I was struck by the number one response from women who have left the community, and I, and Jana blogged about this. Um, it wasn't a doctrinal or even um, kind of uh, church government question about authority or, or, or women's participation or women's kind of spiritual uh, empowerment. It was, I felt judged or misunderstood. Right. And that was kind of the, 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 the pastoral side in me. It was kind of jarring because I was, I was half expecting something else. And it was this viscerally personal fit Right question. So I, 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 that 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 resonates with me. Um, so so how do you think? How is the approach different? Uh, as, as you've talked to people, yeah. Um, how is the conversation different if if they're in one of these two different categories? You know, somebody who has yeah. the kind of historical doctrinal questions versus somebody who has the kind of fit it's question. A, it's a great question. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, both groups, at least in my conversation share a kind of trust crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it's not this, it, is it the same thing as a faith crisis? Sometimes we reduce all of these questions to the title faith crisis. That may or may not be helpful. I don't know. Uh, but there's a trust gap there. On the one hand, there the, the questions, the, the things they found on the internet, it, it's a destabilizing question about authority and almost what philosophers would call the epistemology question. How do I know what I know? Right. It's like all the old ways I used to know things. Now I, I'm not sure. I, I thought I, I knew feel... what the first vision was, and yeah. it turns out there's all there's all these stories about it. Right? And now and, I, yeah. yeah. So how, who do I, who who gives me the straight answer? Is it scholars? Is it other folks with questions like me? And so it's almost a trust crisis or an authority crisis. You know, I used to feel like I got answers to my prayers. Can I trust that right. now? That can be a. That's. I've talked well, about that's the that, most unsettling thing of all. Yeah, right? is that it's like uh, they're experiencing loss. They're in mourning about the old way of knowing, and the you know the the fellow traveler in me, even the um, even the former LDS bishop in me, has this. My heart kind of breaks because yeah. they're they're what they're experiencing is loss, a loss of trust in their old ways of knowing, a loss of trust in the kinds of authorities that used to give them meaning and direction. And that, that's, that's a destabilizing place for yeah, folks. Yeah, and I think we have to recognize how wrenching it is yeah. for people. It's I, not I, merely an intellectual exercise. Right, and I, th I think sometimes we, uh, too many within our community, I, I think are a little quick to dismiss these things as a kind of convenient excuse for you know, wanting to walk away. Yeah, it's a go, cover because you, you don't want to live this Sundays. standard. Yeah, right. you, don't, you don't want to live this standard or that standard. So this is your excuse, and I, I think it does minimize the the burden that folks feel when they're when they when they've got these destabilizing questions. I cut you off though. Keep no, well, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, it, and so it's. I think there's a real importance for us to recognize the authenticity and and reality of of this experience. I mean, this this comes back to our own baptismal covenant that we all make. Uh, Mosiah 18, to mourn with those that mourn, to comfort those who stand in need of co in comfort. We, we don't could choose which people we, we mourn with or who we comfort with. We're only going to comfort the people that we, 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 we agree with. Yeah, you've, right? had, you've had a death in the family. Okay, <laughs> right. I can comfort Here's a you. casserole. I can comfort right? you. Yeah, right. I, I know how to do that. But, right. but, but you're, you're not sure about this or that. Can I comfort you? Is it okay to comfort you? Can I right. mourn with you? That You've hit on a, a powerfully raw nerve for Latter-day Saints because Mosiah 18 would say, I think, mm -hmm. you better find a way to comfort and mourn with this person. Right. So I think that has to be our first response is, is a believing that, that somebody is, is coming from a place of integrity and loss and pain and so forth. And, and so then we accompany them uh, in, in, in this journey. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you say, there's another side to this, though, yeah. of, of the, the people who are still going to the church, right? I mean, the, the, the parents of these people, the spouses, spouses right? I mean, it's wrenching people. when this yeah. happens, when, when one spouse, you know, they, they started their marriage, especially if, you know, an LDS marriage, they were sealed in the temple. There were expectations yeah. going into that marriage of what their life together was going to look like. And a lot of it centered on the church. Yeah. And now when one person distances themselves, again, for, for, for very authentic reasons, yeah. right? Oftentimes they, they have a hard time to even have this conversation with their spouse. But then when they do, what happens to that relationship? Shattering. Or what happens to the parent? We have this language of, you know, an empty seed at the table in the celestial kingdom. That's heavy. Right? It's really heavy. It's really heavy. I, and I think, yeah. Uh, We've been talking about that pain and that sense of loss and mourning on the part of the person whose who, whose faith is it, it seems to be ebbing or um, you know kind of falling through their hands like sand. They can't keep it. They can't hold it. But you're right. You've hit on that other the other part of the equation, and that's been some of the most difficult conversations I've ever had. Yeah. Is a parent whose heart is broken, and it's not like that child was. Um, lost to death and they're just, it's their absence that they're now sorting right. through, which is hard enough. I mean, right, right, sure. But this is a different kind of shattering that in some ways for some of these parents, I wonder if it's almost worse because it's like they're, 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 they're dying every day for them. And, they're, and they've got this vision as Latter-day Saints for an afterlife and an eternity. And it's like absence that's never going to quit. Yeah. And, it, and that, is, that is almost incalculable. 
that that pain I've I've seen in parents or spouses and so on. And I, and I, I you know, neither of us are um, are therapists that could give um, professionalized counsel in that sense. Wrong Again, kind of doctors. Wrong kind of doctors. Yeah. Uh, as 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 my son once said, um, you know, uh, no, not not the kind of doctor that helps people. Right. <laughs> Trying to help someone kind of orient themselves to me. Now, don't misunderstand. Exactly. Right. Said my son. It doesn't actually help people. Uh, but as fellow travelers and as folks who spend a lot of time trying to interpret the LDS experience, both historically and in the present for others, um, y- y- Mosiah 18 came to your mind. Third Nephi 18 comes to my mind. The Lord's talking about the sacrament and about those who, um, even those who won't be numbered anymore among the people, do not cast them out mm-hmm. from among you. Do not those who aren't numbered among the people. Do not cast them out from your worship. Yeah. Do and it's repeated so many times, starting in about verse twenty-two, and then keeps going verse after verse after verse. Do not cast yeah. them out. And why? The end of that. The end of that flow scripturally is the Savior saying you don't know what's going to happen with right. him. Right. Don't you write the end of that chapter. I write the end of that chapter. They write the end of that chapter. Yeah. Don't, you, yeah. don't you assume you know how this story ends. And that, that's a potent theological, but I think it should be a potent social point for us as well. That, that um, if we've made a mistake by by making that, that the life of faith a kind of all or nothing gamble right. of certainty. Right. Because neither of us want to back off conviction. Right. Neither of us want to sap the, the tradition of the power matter. of testimony. That's, right. that's right. not where we're at. It's not where I ever want us to be. Yeah. But if we've made it seem like too high a gamble, a too, you know, where are you this minute? If you're not all in, then you're all at. Right. If, if that. Which if, side are you on? If that's right. too fraught. Yeah. And if, if, if you and I, and I think we both do, want to do justice to what the life of faith actually looks like in all of us, and that is, it's dynamic. Yeah. We're always growing. We're sometimes shrieking. We're going up. We're going a little down. Hopefully the trajectory's up. But if it's dynamic, um, then we have to let that dynamism be what it is in our theology. Um, I think I think one th- one thing that w- w- there's a temptation to do on sort of both sides of this is to reduce people to their faith crisis. Right? I mean, I, I once heard somebody say, you know, for, for for people who leave the church, they could go on and win a Nobel Prize, and their mother would still be heartbroken. Right. So now we understand the heartbreak on one level, right? The Nobel Prize doesn't travel with you to the celestial kingdom, right? But but the sense of being able to see that that's that's how we define people is is purely uh, in relationship to to this this dip in in their faith life, and sometimes that happens for for the person going through it themselves as well. That that becomes the way that they define themselves, and sometimes they alienate themselves from their family. Yeah. And from their former relationships, their friendships, you know, the, the people that they had in the church, they step away. Now, I, I understand some of that dynamic, right, and in yeah. terms of wanting to step away and create, kind of clear your head and create some space. Yeah. But, but to step away from your family, from your spouse, because you've defined yourself in this way, I'm not sure that that's the healthiest way. So is, is there a way that we can recognize the wholeness of a human person, right? Uh, and not just limit that them to whatever challenges they're having, whatever doubts they're having, uh, in, in in their spiritual life. Yeah, and I yeah I'm I'm with you, and I think that that sense of the unendedness of the spiritual journey might help us do some of that. I'm I was I'm struck by I've got another passage of scripture now in my Alma 32, right? That you're even if you have certainty, or might we add uncertainty on mm-hmm. that thing, are you done? No, there's right. the next mountain to climb. There's the next, there's the next thing to do. Um, it feels like we have a lot of hard work to do together um, to find ways to uh, continue to love. What reward have we if we love 
only the person who perfectly fits our right. image of them. I, I don't right. think we've got a lot there. And yeah. so for those of us still in the, still in the communal fold, um, we might feel self-assured by, bring, by drawing bright lines around those who fit our mm-hmm. sense. But boy, we will have squandered our birthright a little bit, won't we? Because we'll, yeah. be, we'll be self-assured. Yeah. We'll be small. Right. We'll feel pure. Right. Uh, but we won't be much of an influence for good in the in the in outside that very that very small thing. Yeah, and we will have lost so much of the kind of gifts and talents that, that people can bring. You know, what there's uh, Zion it sort of plays out in different ways in the scriptures, but but in, in section forty five it talks about Zion in pretty capacious terms, and it's not just church members yeah. or covenanted church members. It's it's Zion is for anybody who doesn't want to be at war with other people, right? And does not have a mind to injure one another. And they come, and Zion is a refuge where they, they come uh, for, for some, kind of, some kind of peace, right? And it, it is a harbor, but it's so interesting that it's not just for those in the covenant, but it's for all people of goodwill. Yeah. And that there's a way that it's, even if somebody is going through a, a, a period of a faith crisis or faith transition, there's, there's, you know, for me, there's always the question of, can you stay in the orbit, right? Can you recognize the goodness of this community that helped form you? And can you still contribute in some ways? Now, it's, there's a big world out there that we need to contribute to as well. Yeah. But, but can you, you bring your, your gifts and, and talents? And maybe, the, maybe we can wrap up by thinking about one of the challenges that I've seen sometimes, or, or one of the phenomenon, is that sometimes when people leave the church, they also leave everything behind. They leave God, they leave Jesus. I mean, wh- why do you think that happens? And, and, and what, do, what yeah. do you say to somebody who, uh, it's, it's not just walking away from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, yeah. but it's, it's, it's kind of like, I'm done with religion. Yeah, yeah, I've wondered about that. Is it that the, the LDS way is so totalizing yeah. in, it, in its demands that it's like the whole canopy falls for someone. I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. I've, and I've seen variations of it in different folks, but I've seen that same yeah. thing that like no, it's like theism itself can't hold. And that's, maybe, that's, be, maybe because their, their testimony of God and Jesus so wound. Came, came the same way that their testimony of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon came too. Yeah. And, and so you talked about trust. And so if they feel like those answers about the specific LDS claims don't hold anymore. Well, that's the same way that they knew, or, or maybe they never independently thought through their relationship to Jesus, but it was always through a kind of LDS yeah. lens, right? I mean, and, 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 and I think there's reasons for that. I mean, we believe that the restored gospel has unique insights and unique things to say about our Christianity. Yeah. But is there a way to preserve a life of fidelity in a religious sense, you know, a, a life of prayer, a life of devotion, even if one steps away from the particular yeah. community for a time. I hope so. I mean, I, it just reminds me of a, a, and this is a kind of a pastoral experience, but speaking to a young woman who felt like her questions and her struggles had gotten to a point where she needed to disaffiliate. And so um, as a kind of church leadership group, we just asked for time to, to talk. So I was with her and her husband and just kind of going through it and she was kind of going through some of her kind of convictions and I, I just I was moved by them and yeah. I said you know I I share all of those you've just listed everything you've just listed is your core values and convictions I share everyone with you and I hope it's not offensive if I say The, the church, this people, the gospel, gave me all of those. Right. Right. And so the things, that you're, the things that you're listing as the reasons why you must leave are the things that I value most that the people... And that compel the, me to stay. That compel me to stay. Right. And I hope that those shared values can be a bridge over which you and I can walk and comprehend each other and be good to each other mm-hmm. and... Um, and kind of link arms in good causes still, because I, I think they're what unite us, not what divide us. So I hope so. I hope so. I, I, I think you're right. I think I hope that that 
they take those. Is it the inverse of the great President Hinckley maxim? You know, take the good things you have and see if we can add to them. Like, right. don't forget the good things right. that that you found here, that formed you here, that that bless all of us here. And parents, don't forget the good things about your child, right? Yeah. And yeah. and all this, so it works both ways. Yeah. Right? Uh, the, the, the kind of love and charity and, and generosity that, the, that we want to show to one another. It's wonderful. We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs>